Hey everyone, welcome to Food Talk Live. A reminder that this episode will also appear on Food Tank's podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nuremberg, and you can listen wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Uh, today I get to talk to uh, Fatima Sumar, the Vice President of Global Programs, Regional Development, and Humanitarian Response at Oxfam America. Oxfam America is one of those uh, organizations that I truly love. They have been a great partner to Food Tank over the years and we're really just honored that they continue to work with us and continue to do such amazing work. Uh, Fatima joined Oxfam in 2018 and oversees their regional development and humanitarian response programs. She comes to Oxfam with a distinguished career in the US government leading US efforts to advance sustainable development and economic policy in emerging markets and fragile countries. Most recently, she served as the Regional Deputy Vice President in Europe, Asia, Pacific, and Latin America at the US Millennium Challenge Corporation. She also worked in the US State Department and was a staff member on the US Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee. So we're very, very honored to have her expertise with us today. Fatima, thank you so much for joining me. Um, before we begin, just want to make sure that everyone in your family and in your community is doing okay during this really kind of scary time for us all. Hi, Danny. It's so great to be with you guys today. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for asking. Yeah, we're, we're so blessed. We're doing okay. I have three girls. They have transitioned from um, elementary and middle school to what we have dubbed Sumar School in our Sumar household. And so we're learning as we go, but thank you. And it's been a learning journey, I think, for all of us. Absolutely. We're all trying to figure this out as we go along. Every day is different. Um, so, you know, I just want to dive right in. Uh, Oxfam America works all over the world and uh, including in the U.S. And I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the ways that you and your team and your colleagues are really responding to the, the, the COVID-19 crisis. How, how are you dealing with all of this? Right. So, you know, the first thing I just want to really unpack a little bit is we're living during an unprecedented time period right now, mm -hmm. right? We've never seen this at this scale any time during our lifetimes before. So this is an unprecedented pandemic, and it's, it's really sending global shocks through our system. So organizations like Oxfam are both um, you know, on the front lines trying to figure out how best to respond, but we also know we can't do it alone. We're really trying to figure out how we're gonna need to work really collaboratively with governments, the private sector, and everyday citizens to figure out how to really protect as many lives as possible. We're also really focused on the most vulnerable populations. We know all around the world that already before this crisis, over 800 million people went to bed hungry every night before this crisis. We know that already before this crisis, 70 million people were displaced due to conflict and other, other economic shocks. Mm -hmm. so the challenges in our system, in our humanitarian system, in our economic system were overwhelming before COVID-19 hit. Right. Now we're really trying to figure out together, what do we do now? We're focused already in leveraging our expertise in programs and planning around water, sanitation, and hygiene um, in all around the world. And we're also looking to respond here in the United States and really looking to make sure that the policies here in the United States appropriately meet, meet the needs of our times. And, and do you think the policies that you know folks are talking about or the stimulus package that was passed, do you think they're meeting the challenges of these very, very unprecedented times? Yeah. So let's 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 take one specific stream of that because there's so many that we could look at. So um, you know, let's talk about something that you and I are thinking about every single day is how do we feed our families here at home? Where does our food come from? How do we go to the grocery stores and what are right. the store workers and, and um, making sure there's enough supply for all of us during these times. We are looking specifically, when we look at grocery stores, we know that these are the workers that are in the front lines, really, of the, along with healthcare workers, grocery store mm -hmm. workers in the front lines of this crisis. They go to work every single day. Most of them can't afford to miss a day's work because of the wages that they have to bring in because they don't have access to sick care, paid leave, or medical insurance in some cases, right? So we also know that 70% of these cashiers, the retail cashiers, are women. So this also hits women in the healthcare industry as well. 70% of the people on the front lines are women, right? So when we go to get our groceries right now, we know that the workers are stocking our shelves and they don't have access yet to the same 
the same um, benefits that many of us take for granted, like paid sick right. leave, proper equipment, or training. So we all get that. We all know that. We see that in the headlines. But how do we appropriately respond right now to keep them safe and to keep our food supply safe? So a couple of specific ways that we're looking to respond and really needing help from, from, from all of us to mobilize and bring our voices together. The first is we're calling, Oxfam's calling on U.S. grocery stores to take crucial steps to protect workers mm -hmm. and to support um, store, stores to remain safe and healthy. So three specific things. First, grocery store owners really have a responsibility to provide paid sick leave for all their workers, right? Absolutely. We knew that before, but COVID is driving home that the fundamental truth is if you're sick, wherever you work in the economy, you should be able to stay at home. Well, and especially in food, but you're absolutely right. Wherever it is in the economy, whatever job you have, you should be able to stay home if you don't feel good. I mean, that just makes sense. So I was astonished, like many of us last week, when the Whole Foods CEO suggested that workers donate their sick time to their coworkers who become sick. Whole Foods, right? A company yeah. can afford to offer sick leave to their workers. Mm -hmm. So the first is supermarkets have a responsibility to provide paid sick leave. The second is how do we is really ensuring that all our workers have the protective um, equipment, the prop, the PPEs, and the training in order to stay safe. There's simple steps that all supermarkets can take. Workers often know what works best, frankly, and so it's not always corporate headquarters that have the solutions, but really bringing workers into that dialogue and making sure that they themselves can be really safe and healthy because that affects all of us. Absolutely. And then the third thing is working with workers to develop the best solutions. So um, many stores have unions, they have worker advocates in, in these jobs. Everyone from cashiers to deli counter workers, they have concerns. They wanna stay safe and healthy so that they can continue the critical work that they're doing. Bring their voices in, ask them what's working, making sure that we can work together with them and not just from a corporate headquarter um, far, far away in, in the supply chain. So those are three critical areas with um, our grocery stores. And we'll be launching a petition this week, actually, calling on all U.S. grocery stores to take these three simple steps and would love um, help from your viewers and driving this home. And that'll be available at OxfamAmerica.org, correct? Yes. So you can visit OxfamAmerica.org. We have tons and tons of resources and ways that people can be involved, and we'll be launching this week. Um, and we'll be um, sure to... Great. We'll be sure to put that on our website and our social media as well, and we'll, we'll help get it out there. I love that you, you mentioned, you know, that third point of, of working with workers. I think that is often so left out of this conversation when, when um, workers don't have the ability to unionize where they work or they don't have the ability, you know, to sort of collectively decide what their best needs are. I think that's a fantastic suggestion. And I think grocery stores are now going to be put in a position where they have to take workers' um, rights and, and concerns in, into account more than they have. Um, I, I also love that you really focused on women and talking about how, you know, 70% of grocery store workers are women. Women are on the front lines of, of health care right now uh, with COVID-19. But we, we were talking a little bit before about the, the White House uh, COVID task force. And can you remind everyone what that task force looks like? Yeah. So when you think about, at the end of the day, when you think about who's in charge to make a lot of these big decisions, make recommendations to the U.S. Uh, to U.S. citizens and the U.S. population. It's our representatives in charge. So in this case, we all see every single day on CNN, you know, during prime time hour, representatives from the COVID-19 task force that the White House has set up. And they're really on the front lines to help figure out the best way possible of how we're going to respond. Mm -hmm. 12 people on that task force, um, uh, sorry, 12 people on that task force, all men, 12 men and 11 of them who are white. Right. So when you think about even the representation of who's in charge here, largely men, we just we just talked about how 70 percent of people on the front lines are women. Mm -hmm. And there's one woman on this task force. We talk a lot about vulnerable communities, different types of communities who need different types of access and voice. And yet predominantly 11 out of the 12 are also white and not representing communities of color. These are huge gaps in what we talk about power distribution 
and how we actually make sure that all of us are represented in whatever community that we're part of to make sure that these policies work for us, that they actually work for us. And so representation and diverse representation is really more important than ever. Absolutely. It's astounding to me. It's 2020 and we're still fighting these same battles that our, that our mothers and our grandmothers fought, you know, so, so hard. So it, it's, it's still astounding. So, you know, you've talked about how you're working in the U.S. with grocery store workers. What's happening sort of globally that Oxfam America is involved in to prevent some of the, you know, you mentioned that pe the, the vulnerable populations who, who are at risk for, you know, um, the impacts of climate change or the impacts of conflict, they're already, you know, very, very vulnerable. This is, is making them more so. So how, how is Oxfam America addressing their concerns and their needs right now? Yeah, so thanks, thanks for asking, Danny. So if, if we shift to the world and what's happening on a global response, there's a few critical steps that organizations like Oxfam are taking already. We're really concerned about the most vulnerable populations, right? So communities that already are in, in countries that already have weaker health systems, places where people are already facing multiple threats to their health and livelihoods. We're really concerned about when COVID-19 hits uh, vulnerable areas like refugee camps and places where people are already struggling to access adequate health care, safe and clean drinking water, and making sure they have enough food to eat. So mm -hmm. collectively, we know that the impact as COVID scales up, and uh, we're seeing it in the West right now in this wave, but especially as it starts to hit Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and other vulnerable populations, Frankly, the impact here could be devastating and on a scale that none of us have ever seen before and we're not really prepared globally to respond to. So we're working every single day right now with governments, key United Nation agencies, and we're working in over 65 countries with partners to really figure out how's, what are the best ways to respond to this crisis. How do we really work through partners through a local humanitarian leadership model that puts partners and local leaders at the forefront of this? That's great. How do we leverage our expertise in public health, water, and sanitation? So already on the ground today, we have teams in many countries increasing the delivery of soap, sanitation services. We've been putting up hand washing facilities. We've been getting clean water to people who are living in higher risk areas. We're also focusing really on community engagement, right? So these are communities where um, we have to help minimize the risk. We have to actually, con we have to convince people in some cases that there's a real threat out there. They don't have right. access to information in the same way you and I are reading it coming across our Twitter feeds or our-, our Too Twitter much of it, yeah. <laughs> so um, helping explain to people the real urgency of this threat, why it's different than other pandemics that maybe we haven't faced here in the United States, but others have like Ebola mm -hmm. or SARS or in other cases. And um, really making sure that we can send out accurate information and in local languages. We're, you know, one of the things that we're, sh we're really um, dealing with is localizing our response to local contexts and really making sure that we can anticipate the different phases of the outbreak. Um, everything from preparedness and planning, which is where we are today um, in some countries, to already responding in places like Hong Kong, for instance, who hit right. earlier than us, we're responding in places like Italy, right, that are have been really hard hit, and in Spain, and then dealing with the aftermath and, and the rebuilding in the socioeconomic context. Um, so those are just some of the big picture global areas that we're sure. on right now. And I just want to say again, it's it's un, an unprecedented time. So really figuring out with the with the UN with governments, how do we build up the capacity to really do this at scale is probably going to be the challenge of our lifetime. Absolutely. And, and I like how you keep mentioning working with local partners and local communities. That's such a big part of this. If, if we're really going to fight this mm -hmm. virus in, a, in an effective and efficient way, I, I, I am interested in, you know, how this is going to affect places where people can't do any of the physical distancing that has been recommended by you know, the WHO and the CDC, places like refugee camps, informal workers in places uh, like India or you know, uh, uh, slums in Sub-Saharan Africa. What, what are we going to do to help those people who have no ability? They won't be able to make money or eat if they're physically distancing themselves from one another. So that's literally, Danny, the $100 million question right now, I think, that we're trying to figure out, right, is in, 
in crowded urban areas where many vulnerable populations already live, right? And you can think about major cities in India and Sub-Saharan Africa and many other places in refugee camps where people are crowded together, where we are already struggling to meet basic needs pre-COVID before all of this broke out, where the system mm -hmm. was really constrained by resources. How do we do this? So um, we are looking at how we reprioritize some of our resources and programming. We're really looking at a different type of partnership model. I think these are the types of questions. I don't actually have all the answers right now. Sure. Today, we're literally no going to figure out how to do some of this stuff. But what we do know right now is that the scale of what we're looking at is, is enormous. Um, I'd love to, you know, I can share with you a little bit of our initial thinking around mm -hmm. Some of the shocks that we're seeing, particularly around the global food systems and what we anticipate could come. Um, because I think that's when we start getting a handle of what this could look like in the large scale, then it helps us also with the planning as well. Yeah, please talk about those. So, you know, we talked a little bit earlier that pre outbreak of this crisis, about 820 million people didn't have enough food to eat already, right? So a significant portion um, as we think about that. The irony is the majority of hungry people around the world work in agriculture as producers or laborers, right? That's literally- Oh, so ironic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, such, it's, there's so much irony there and that millions of more people live on the edge of poverty who work in our food chains and our food value chains, right? Um, we know women are particularly vulnerable to this type of economic insecurity. And as producers, they face uh, multiple barriers and many more barriers, uh, informal and formal, to accessing the tools that they need. So this was all pre-COVID. As we start looking at the analysis of what's now coming out, there's a strong possibility that we're seeing that there could be disruptions to production, increased food prices, and reduce purchasing power for so many households that could lead to a spike in global hunger. So um, there's four shocks in particular that I'll, I'll dissect a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So the first is supply shocks. Um, as countries start taking these drastic measures to stop transmission of corona, you could see where these extreme measures such as restricting the movement of people or goods could create significant supply shocks, right? So, you know, we know already that we have restriction on the movement of goods um, in many, many countries, but we need to make sure they have exceptions for food products, because if you break sure. the food chain, you can imagine how that would then affect supermarket shelves all around the world, including Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Well, and, we and that happened during Ebola, the Ebola crisis as well, didn't it? You know, seeds couldn't be transported, food couldn't be transported across borders, and many people who didn't get, you know, Ebola suffered extreme, uh, you know, hunger because they weren't able to access food. That's right. So really making sure that we can protect the food supply chain here um, from supply shocks, supply shocks is going to be really important. Um, production shortfalls here could also result in significantly less production of food, both for communities and countries, right? Um, one particular thing on the supply side is if you see food exporting countries start to implement export restrictions to protect their own markets and domestic markets, you're going to see food importing countries really bear the brunt of that, right? So in our global food chains, that could have a huge disruption around supply. Mm -hmm. the, second, the second shock is price shocks. So, um, you know, it's not hard. It, it's, it's easy to imagine in some ways, right? If you start seeing export restrictions, supply disruptions, production shortfalls, and hoarding of food, all of that collectively starts leading to increases in prices for basic foods, things like rice, maize, wheat, that mm -hmm. people rely on for daily sustenance all around the world. So let's look at Vietnam, for example. Vietnam is the third largest rice producer in the world, and they've announced already a temporary ban on rice exports. Mm -hmm. Now, in that, so if the ban is maintained, that could significantly drive up the price of rice, right? The last time major exporters halted rice exports, the price of rice nearly tripled in the world, leading to widespread food insecurity. So, you know, we could see significant shocks just coming from decisions that individual countries make in their own markets around um, that that affect price. Well, and around the, the price shock question, I mean, we're talking like, I think what we forget, you know, as sort of privileged, you know, Westerners is that, you know, 
food is relatively cheap for us, no matter really how price, you know, prices go up and down a little bit, but we, we are spending maybe, you know, seven to 10% of our sort of incomes uh, or our budgets on food. For people in, in the global South, they're spending a lot more of what they make on food, 50, sometimes 80%, especially during something like this. So they have very little left over for healthcare or for schooling or for anything else. That's right. And also they don't, they don't have the substitution effect as much as we, as we do. Right. So if I, if I decide we were talking earlier, you know, if I'm cooking a recipe and I don't have access to ingredients A, B, and C, frankly, I have D, E, and F in my pantry that right. I can substitute for that and still feed my family. That option doesn't exist for millions around the world that are very um, dependent on certain, on certain crops for sustenance. So you can see how all that starts to add up. Absolutely. Um, so I'll talk, I'll talk, uh, there's two more shocks that I'll put on the table. Mm -hmm. so the third is income shocks. So you can see as economies shut down and people become quarantined, the economic impact is going to be severe and drastic. You're seeing that already here in the United States, right? In a sharp decrease in people's ability to actually purchase food or basic necessities because their income drops, right? Maybe they're being furloughed from work. Maybe they lose their jobs. Maybe they're unable to work because they're sick. Um, for those in the informal market, and you're seeing this play out already in places like India, for instance, where a significant portion, um, about 100 million or so, are part of an, in, you know, or, or, uh, more are part of an informal economy. So people like food vendors and local markets, they can lose their supply of fresh fruits and vegetables, and they're going to lose their customers. There's no replacement. So the income shocks are quite real and could have a really damaging effect. Absolutely. The, the fourth is nutrition shocks, right? So, you know, as families are forced to shelter in place, as their access to healthy, fresh food, uh, fresh food, uh, especially fruits and vegetables could be curtailed, many of them, and many of us already, you're starting to see this play out, are starting to resort to eating packaged or processed foods, right? They're higher in fat, sodium, and sugar, right? Um, during a health crisis, and we've seen this play out in, in previous health crises, the lack of healthy food further erodes our ability to fight off disease and remain healthy. So the very you know, health that we need to maintain in order to collectively recover from a disease as debilitating as coronavirus, ironically, our immune systems could be even weaker and compromised if we don't have access to safe, healthy food. And already so many people don't have access to that, but adding to those numbers and making it even more difficult to get access to that could have huge nutrition shocks that affect collective global health responses. So yeah, I mean, it, areas okay, that we're really, you know, we're, we're struggling, we're really struggling to think about I, what do we do with that collectively because absolutely. writing the rules of the road. No, thanks for going through all those, those four shocks. It's very illuminating. It's, it's very, it's very dire. I mean, what, your last point about the nutrition impact, you know, I've been talking to physicians, you know, over the last couple of weeks on, on this, uh, show and, and on our podcast. And, you know, one outcome that they're very nervous about is the increase in diet related diseases as people are turning to those more processed foods and, you know, leading to obesity and heart disease and diabetes and, and, you know, a, a whole slew of other diet related diseases, which costs, you know, trillions to the global economy already. And that's not what we want to come out of this. We want people to be eating, as you said, nutrient dense foods that provide more immunity. To, to, you know, the coronavirus and to every other sort of health issue out there. Yeah, no, it's really, there's so much here to process and take in. But I think, um, you know, I'm, I am, I do get uplifted that there are ways forward here. Um, and Absolutely. even though it's a challenging time, we do know things that work. We have, we have lots of evidence and decades of research and evidence. And we've, we've been testing out every single day programs and policies that actually make people healthier, that reduce vulnerabilities, and that bring people out of poverty. So we actually do have the solutions. Our challenge now is to move quickly and urgently and get them to scale. Yeah, the urgency is very, very, uh, you know, that's key here. And, and getting those things scaled and replicated, as you said, I think is, is the key question. One thing that I've really liked about Oxfam is that you, you connect the global to the, the domestic here in the United States. This is, you know, I think people in the United States are feeling very sort of 
um, a little bit down and out right now. They're losing their jobs, you know, they're stuck at home, but this is something that we're all in together and it's going to affect the world as a whole. So thank you, you know, for painting that picture of what could happen globally, but also some of the solutions that are out there. And I know you and your team have been really, really busy this last week and you probably get down yourself as well, but I also know that there are a lot of inspiring examples out there. Do you wanna share some of the, the things that you've seen that are really keeping you hopeful during this crazy time? Well, I'm gonna talk about something in my personal life actually. Um, and just to say, so there's a local organization and Danny, you were up here in Cambridge, you know, when you were, when you were doing some of your studies. So you know, you know this area well up here in Massachusetts. There's a local nonprofit here called Food for Free and they work on getting um, food, healthy food to vulnerable communities here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, I've been volunteering with them uh, during this crisis to help see how we can get uh, food out there. And I'm doing a really tiny, tiny part. So I don't wanna exaggerate at all, my role at all. I, I've just been completely uplifted that even during such difficult times when the rest, when all of us are kind of just shutting down and trying to figure out how to keep ourselves and our families safe. Right literally have a volunteer brigade of just people in the neighborhood all around in local towns up here where I live in um, Boston who are going around working for, with organizations like Food for Free and helping um, get packaged food, get food and literally driving in cars and dropping food off to different people in the community and really awesome. saying the time to come together and that we have incredible power. We have incredible power and being stuck at home and social distancing in, in a way we're more connected than ever. And that's the irony of social distancing. So um, if, if I'll leave you with five simple things we can all do. Does that work? Perfect. So I have five simple things that I've been thinking a lot about and Oxfam has been working on and it's on our webpage as well. So the first is take care of yourself right? Stay healthy because if each of us don't stay healthy, active, and if we don't stay calm, then this becomes really much harder than it needs to be. The second is take care of others, right? Um, we are all have responsibility to flatten the curve and give our healthcare workers and other frontline workers the chance that they need to handle this, but check in on family and friends, make video calls, and ask how we can help. The third is small businesses. I mean, all of us in our communities have small and local businesses, including our restaurants, grocery stores, farms, um, help, you know, either purchasing from them, buying gift cards, or just doing what we can to help them stay in business, right? So that we can see this through. The fourth is really getting involved. Like now is more, more um, the most important time to actually get involved with uh, civil service. I'm sorry, with mm -hmm. um, civil society with local organizations and global organizations that are really on the front lines of this crisis. So supporting your local food bank, more important than ever, going to Charity Navigator and looking out for highly rated charities like Oxfam that are on the front lines to do this work. And then the fifth is pushing for new policies. We started this podcast talking about um, sick leave, right? And how sick leave should be something, you don't need corona to have sick leave, right? right. That, common sense that if you're sick, you should be able to stay at home. So now's our time. Let's, let's push for policies that actually help us collectively succeed. Things like sick leave, free corona testing, food assistance for low-income communities, and for children. Um, we all have a voice. We can use our laptops. We can use our, our phones and social media accounts to raise those voices and put pressure on all of our policymakers to take real action and to stop making excuses because you know, the urgency of surviving this collectively and coming out stronger is more important than ever. And then the last thing I just want to say, Dan, is just to say, really inspired by people like you and the work who <laughs> is doing, and just to say your work as an ambassador for Oxfam, as a sister on the planet, and just raising your voice over and over again for all the things that we talked about. It is really inspirational to the thousands of us that follow the work that Food Tank is doing. So I just wanted to take that moment to also personally thank you. That was very kind of you. Thank you so much. But that's such great advice that you just gave. And I, especially the last point about getting involved 
and pushing for policies that you believe in, protecting those frontline workers from grocery stores to truck drivers to uh, nurses and, and, and public health advocates. They really need our help right now. Also, Oxfam America needs our help right now. So please go to OxfamAmerica.org. And if you can, please donate to the incredible work that they're doing. Fatima, you are a treasure. Thank you so much for being on this show and uh, really sharing your insight. A reminder that this episode will also appear on Food Tank's podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. Um, and join us later today at 5 p.m. Eastern time when I'll be uh, talking to Dr. Mark Hyman. Fatima, thank you again. Please stay well. The world needs you. Thank you Bye. so much.